Good morning, good morning. I don't know who's in or who's on, but hey. Uh, Psalms 8. Let me know if things are okay in terms of the broadcast. Can you see me? Is it glitchy? Um, yeah, okay. Okay, everybody. Let me know if that's working for you. Is that working for you? Psalm 8, Psalm of Orientation. Um, is that okay? Just give me some signals to let me know if that's working for you. All right, so Psalm 8. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version, verses 1 through 9. O Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mindful of them, mortals that you care for them, yet you've made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honour. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands and put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen and the beasts of the field, and the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, wherever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our sovereign Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. I want to talk about being meant for more, directing your attention to verse 4, the perennial and pivotal question in this psalm. What are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them, meant for more. I've been enjoying the BBC series, The Blue Planet and The Blue Planet 2, a wildlife documentary series presented and narrated by David Attenborough, exploring our planet's oceans. The program takes you into the depths of the world's oceans and you see scucklefish and squid seahorses and starfish um, and you wonder at creatures of dazzling beauty and grotesque um, appearance and, and incredible strength. You experience the wonder of se seldom seen parts of our universe and parts of our planet. Amazing sights like the birthing of sperm whales and you see sperm whales calves and mothers feeding their newborn gallons of milk, bath loads of milk in the deep blue sea. You observe the skill of a troop of sea lions cooperating to hunt, to corral, and ultimately to trap tuna. Uh, just absolutely amazing. You see a world teeming with exotic and mind-blowing beauty. You also see a world that is at risk and under threat as a result of human behavior. You see a world that is at that. You see a world that is impacted by discarded plastic. The destruction of our coral reefs, the melting of ice caps, ice caps uh, because of global warm, warm, warning, warming, sorry, which are the habitat of polar bears and walrus and a myriad of all other types of life forms. The beauty, the power of creation, just opposed with the destructive choices and life limiting behaviors of human beings. Psalm 8 is another psalm of orientation. According to Walter Brogman, these psalms in various ways are expressions of creation faith. They affirm that the world is a well-ordered, reliable and life-giving system because God has ordered it that way and continues to provide, preside over the process. Brogman continues, the function of this kind of psalm, Psalm 8 and the Psalms of Orientation, is theological. That is to praise and thank God. But such a psalm also has a social function. It is to articulate and maintain a quote-unquote sacred canopy under which the community of faith can live out its faith with freedom from anxiety. Um, it's it, 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 Again, I want to quote that last section again. A sacred canopy under which the community of faith can live out its life with freedom from anxiety. Psalm 8, to some extent, functions in this way. It praises God, but also presents creation as a sacred canopy. 
The psalmist exclaims in verses one through to three, O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark or a fortress because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established. This idea of setting from the Hebrew word, which means to give, uh, uh, the setting of God's glory, majesty, splendor, and vigor above the heavens, speaks of the Lord's, of God's sovereignty. Uh, God founded a bulwark or a fortress of strength out of the mouth of babes and infants, speaks of the gifting, God's gifting of this world with unfettered potential and boundless possibilities. And then we come to the perennial question, in verse 4, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? What are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? In asking this question, the psalmist makes the point that God is mindful. That is, God is aware, marking and noticing even the minutest detail of human life, actively and consciously, carefully monitoring our progress and development. Not only is God mindful, but God also cares for us. The word translated as care from the Hebrew is pakwad, which means both to care for, but also to empower, to appoint, up, to empower, to appoint or to lay a charge upon somebody or to commission a person. The word also means to make a significant investment in a person or to endow someone with great wealth. Ultimately, God is mindful and attentive to us as human beings, but God also lavishes particular attention and care and, and potential on human beings as a species. The psalmist continues to exclaim, yet you have made them a little lower than God. Verse 5. Crown them with glory and honour. You've given them dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen and all the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea and whatever passes along the paths of the sea. The psalmist makes the extraordinary assertion that human beings are second only to God. Um, this made the, or the translators of the King James Version so nervous. It was such a disconcerting claim that the translators deliberately mistranslate the word Elohim, which is normally translated as God or gods, by using the word angels, a little lower than the angels. But the original is that we are second only to God. The Psalms tells us that humanity is crowned. That means we are encircled. We are hedged about with glory. That's kabod in the Hebrew. Weightiness, gravitas, glorious abundance. That's who you are. You're someone who's been crowned with magnificence, honor, and excellence. Together, the words glory and honor refer to our transcendent capacity to do and become more. All things are under our feet. We have been given dominion. It's amazing to me that as earthbound creatures, we have plumbed the depths of the oceans. And just this last week, I don't know if you heard in the news, but we sent probes into Mars. There are seemingly no limits to what we as a species are able to do. Again, the psalmist says in verse 6, and I'm going to read it again. You have given human beings dominion over the works of your hands. You put all things under their feet, all sheep, oxen, and the beasts of the fields, and the bird of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatever passes along the seas. We rule, we dominate over every facet of creation. I don't know if you've noticed, but for all that the psalmist has told us about human beings, the psalmist has still not answered the question that he posed in verse 4, what are human beings that you are mindful of, the mortals that you care for them? The question is still hanging. And I believe that's deliberate. 
The psalmist asks the question and then points to our almost unlimited potential and then leaves us to ponder and respond to the question, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? I actually think that the question is a challenge. I think that the question is not just a challenge to us, it's, it's as if the psalmist is saying to each of us, you have so much power, you have so much potential given to you as a gift. Who are you going to become? What kind of human will you be? We have the power to heal or to kill, to create a paradise or to be the architects of our own destruction, creating a living hell for ourselves and everybody with whom we come into contact. The psalmist is presenting us with the possibility of who we are supposed to be, crowned with glory and honour, and honor, made a little lower than God, God's self. And that God is asking us, who do you choose to become? How will you use your creativity, your ingenuity, your boundless possibility? There's a story told of J. Robert Oppenhauer, Oppenheimer, um, Heimer, sorry, J. Robert Oppenheimer, an American theoretical physicist who is credited with being the father of the atomic bomb. And when he witnessed the first detonation of a nuclear weapon on the 16th of July, 1945, Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer uh, quoted from the Bhagavad Gita and said, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. With all of that ingenuity, a theoretical physicist taking his wisdom, his skill in creating about the atoms that resulted in the atomic bomb and he confessed in self-disgust and self-loathing, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I'm going to ask you, what will you become? Psalm 8 is a haunting and taunting challenge. Given all of your power, all of your potential, all of your gifts, all of your talents, all of your possibilities, what do you choose to become? The psalmist tells us that we were meant for more, made a little lower than God God's cell, made a little lower than the sovereign creator of the universe. Who are you and who will you become? What kind of person will you be? How are you going to manage and steward your possibilities and your overwhelmingly generous resources? The psalmist speaks of our power and our responsibility. In referencing the mindful and care, mindfulness rather, and care of God for us, the psalmist is challenging us to be mindful and to care for ourselves and each other as well as our planet. The psalmist is telling us that our world is oriented right when we align ourselves with our Creator's highest and best intentions for human existence. In this way, we work with God to, in the words of Brugman again, articulate and maintain a sacred, a sacred canopy under which the community of faith can live out its life with freedom from anxiety. The psalmist is challenging us to be mindful and careful about how we choose to discharge our dominion as human beings. The word dominion can have both military and agricultural connotations. It can mean to dominate or it can mean to exercise care to the point of flourishing. Exercise care to the point of flourishing. I think that's the kind of human I want to be. I want to exercise care for myself for my, the others in my life and the others in whom I come, with whom I come into contact and my planet. I want to exercise care to the point of flourishing in all of my relationships and all of my interactions. 
Brugman again suggests that the Psalms not only point to such a protective reality, they evoke it, present it and keep it in place. Who you are and what you are, you have are God's gifts to you. Who you become and what you do are your gifts back to God. In this way, you become a living, breathing act of worship. A living, breathing act of worship. Brugman suggests that such worship is world making. These Psalms become the means by which the creator is in fact creating the world. Perhaps one of the meaning of the words of the saying, God creates by word. That creative word is spoken in these Psalms and in the liturgical process. And it is in the world of worship that Israel and the church re-experiences and re-describes the safe world over which God provides, presides rather. What is, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? There's a question that we have to decide on a day-to-day -day basis in how we choose to use our life, how we choose to invest our time, talents, and treasure, how we use to manage and steward our manifold resources. Your life, your life has the possibility to create heaven on earth or hell on earth. You have to decide who you are are meant to be and you do it moment by moment I can be I, I could be somebody who's a wonderful human being in the morning loving and careful but if I forget to be mindful if I forget to be careful by afternoon I, be, I can become death the destroyer of worlds I must make that choice about who I'm meant to be in the moment to moment decisions and actions I choose to make. I can choose to create an apocalyptic hell or I can choose to co-create co with God a paradise which sees the new Jerusalem, literally the new city of peace coming down out of the heavens to the earth, creating heaven on earth how about you what's your decision and the psalmist then ends with a word of praise O oh lord our sovereign lord how majestic is your name in all the earth as you go through this week as you go through this day as you go through the moment moments the moments of your life Remember that you are meant for more. Every time you're tempted to be caught up in the petty nonsense, remember that you are meant for more. Every time you're tempted to have that last word, that, that, that little vindictive quip that lets somebody know how clever you are, remember you were meant for more. Be mindful, be careful, because you are made a little lower than that's who you are. You are a child of a wonderful, beautiful, amazing, heavenly parent who loves each and every one of God's creation passionately, truly, madly.